Are you someone who has a hard time concentrating? Do you often get lost in your head, wander off, and feel like you lack passion and direction in your life? Well, you're not alone. Millions of people feel the exact same way that you do, and you know what? So do I. That's why I'm happy to report that I have found an answer to this problem, and I cannot wait to share it with you. And that answer is fantasy football! And it begins in three weeks, baby. There's a league out there for everyone. You've got standard, you've got PPR, dynasty, even weekly leagues that give you the freedom to draft a new team each week. Move over Christmas, there's a new favorite day of the year, and it's here to stay, and that is draft day, baby! Let's go! Oh, man. Welcome to All Gas, All Georgia Sports. I am glad you guys are here. Cannot wait to get started today. I have a jam-packed show for you. We are going to really get hyped about fantasy football on this episode, in case you uh, can't tell already. We're also going to go over some Braves recap. We're going to recap the series against Houston. The Houston Astros were in town this weekend. We're going to talk about Marcelo Zuna. I mean, how do you not? And is Austin Riley really an MVP? I'm going to discuss that a little bit, and I'm going to think out loud a little bit on that one, so bear with me on that. But I do have some things, some specifics I'm going to go over with that. We're going to do a little Falcons status update, see if there's any new news out there in the world for the Falcons. Stetson Bennett is on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Congrats, Stetson. And UGA, the Georgia Bulldogs, closes in on another top five recruiting class, of course. So we're going to discuss that a little bit. And you know what? This is a great time of year. I always bitch about August because I really don't like this month. But by the time August is wrapping up, I start to get really excited. It actually goes from my least favorite month to my favorite month quickly. Really, really quickly. And that is 100% because of fantasy football and football in general. Now, I'm grateful that we have a good baseball team to watch during this time because if the Braves were just okay, I'm going to be honest with you, by the time July wrapped up, you know, baseball, it can be rough if you don't have a good team, you know? And luckily for us Braves fans, we haven't had really many years with the bad team since 1991. So, yeah, thanks, universe. Thank you, you know, <clears throat> Braves country and the Braves organization for providing us that. You have successfully created generations of Braves fandom uh, for years to come. So, yeah, we just, we always have something, at least in the baseball world, to be excited about for the most part. But, you know, generally speaking, August is rough. It's hot. You go back to school, you know, traffic gets a little bit worse. The school buses come back. And school starts so early now, too. I mean, I feel old now, but I'm not that old. But I feel like I remember it starting at least halfway through August or, like, three weeks into August. But now, like, August 1st, boom, they're back in school. So, yeah, sorry, kids. I I guess they're probably moving toward an, you know, a year-round schooling model. I mean, that would make sense. That's what it seems like, at least. So... Anyhow, August can be rough, but it takes a dramatic turn once I realize that we are, you know, that college football is right around the corner. I mean, you realize, you guys are hearing this episode on a Monday, August 22nd, and in two weeks, we're going to be reviewing and recapping the Georgia game and college football. Two weeks. Two weeks from today, we will be doing an episode of first weekend of college football. Can't wait. Unbelievable. So that's right around the corner. High school football's already started, which is pretty cool. I actually do have a, you know, I'm going to end the show with this, but at the end, when I'm, I, I didn't save that many tweets over the weekend, and but one of them was a high school football highlight, and it was the sickest thing ever. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> so anyways, fantasy football is coming up, and I literally feel like I did as a child in December as the draft approaches. There's nostalgia. It signals like a change in the weather, TV habits, even cable providers. We literally will switch, and I get kind of annoyed with this to tell you the truth. Like, we switch, so we stream everything. And during the baseball season, we have direct TV right now because that's how we can get Bally Sports South because we weren't able to get that channel with YouTube TV or Hulu which is so stupid. I mean, and I was so pissed because we had Hulu 
like last year and the year before because that's how we would get red zone. And when we found out that Bally Sports wasn't going to be on Hulu, it, we had to switch everything, and then we end up having to switch back. So we're going to end up probably having both, which is just absurd. But I can't not watch Red Zone. Red Zone is so good. It, it honestly, it's the way that like crack has been described to me is I think you know similar to Red Zone because it, it's eight hours of commercial free football. It doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. Because one game might go into halftime, but because you're following every single game, right when that happens, other teams are coming back out. And then you can switch back to the Falcons game, and then when they go to commercial, you flip over to red zone. You are never not watching football on Sundays if you have red zone. And some people do the Sunday ticket. You know, I admire you for that. Maybe you're a purist. You want to really get in the weeds with each and every game. But I always get worried at this point that I'm going to miss something because Red Zone is just bam, bam, bam. It is the, you know, TikTok of football. It's the Tinder of football. You just swipe, 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 go, and it's just in your face the entire time. Constant stimulation. Red Zone's amazing. I'm not getting sponsored for any of this, by the way. I just, I'm just genuinely hyped. I'm, consider me Ron Swanson, okay? I endorse things that I believe in. In Red Zone, I'm a, we're a Red Zone family, Okay. Some people are Red Vines, some people are Twizzlers, some people are Sunday Tickets, some people are Red Zone. We are a Red Zone family. It's fantastic. So that's coming up. We're having to discuss who are we going to switch to. Like It's just it's in the air. You can feel it. The, 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 the season is upon us. Um, the other thing about the fantasy football draft is it's one of the most hopeful days of the entire year. Uh, maybe that's sad, you know, depending on how your life is going, but you know, it's true for me. Uh, it's true because right after the draft, everybody's hyped. Everybody thinks their team's going to be great. Some people are like upset at their team. They go, man, I really blew it in this year's draft. And you can kind of feel it. You can tell if you've drafted better, you know, than someone else, but there's still hope because nothing's happened yet. So you still haven't seen, you know, injuries and and how teams look at the beginning of the year because you never know. I was just talking to my wife about this. She was like, oh, my God, look where Cooper Cup is ranked because last year we're going to go over some of, like, um, the top-ranked players in this year's, uh, you know, fantasy football charts or whatever, and Cooper Cup is pretty high. And I was like, well, of course he is. He just had statistically one of the best seasons for a wide receiver ever. I mean, he (laughs) he's unbelievable. And – you know, uh, was in the MVP consideration as a receiver, which means you really had to crush it because, I mean, let's face it, the good chance that's going to go to a quarterback most of the time, kind of like the Heisman, you know? So um, where was I going with that? Oh, yeah, he's ranked higher. But last year, you know, people were picking up Cooper Cup, I want to say, like, fourth, fifth round. I might be wrong there. That might be too high for Cooper Cup, where some people were taking him. And I say that because think about how the Rams have been. It's been Cooper Cup and Robert Woods. And when you have two guys that are both really good, and they kind of, it's like having two good running backs. You know, it's like, man, it's tough to draft one because you want that workhorse guy. You want the guy that's going to just dominate touches. And both Robert Woods and Cooper Cup are beasts, and they would have really good like games, but it was almost like, who's it going to be this week? You know what I mean? And so going into last year, that was kind of, I think, the same idea with Cooper Cup, although he was still taken relatively high. But of course, he exploded, and now he's he might be like 10 overall, I think, on this chart that I'm going to read you guys later. But anyways... Um, Very hopeful at the beginning of the year. Very hopeful on draft day. And I got to tell you this, just for, to in order to properly interpret your, you know, social scenarios and situations, here's something that you need to know. Whenever you're discussing your draft at work the next day, uh, no one cares. Just know at least. Now, you can still have these discussions because I do this all the time, but just know as long as when you go into the conversation that both parties are just waiting for their turn to talk. That is 100% those conversations. When you go in and you go, hey, check out my draft, check out my team, basically that just cues, that that gives the other person permission to then pull out their phone to wait for you to do your little spiel, and then they go, oh, here's my draft, and here's my thing. Oh, guess where I got this guy? Uh, And then the next guy goes, okay, finish up, finish up. And then when you finish your statement, you go, oh, yeah, two years ago I picked up, you know, so-and-so in the fifth round, and no no one could believe it. Okay, wait for that guy to finish. And then it just continues for the next 30 minutes. So pretty much it's a very, um, you know, it's 
it, it can get pretty tiring, but I just can't help myself. I can't help myself. I have those conversations, but you know, just don't get your feelings hurt out there. If anybody does, if they go, man, why doesn't this person care about my draft? Look at how great I did. It's because you probably don't care about how great anyone else did because you're so concentrated on how you did, and that's how it should be. You should admire your team. You should love your team. You should get excited and just, you know, your whole world just fills with joy because the possibilities are endless. It's like looking at a child and you think you could become anything. You could do anything you want in this world. That's how you should feel about your fantasy football team, and it most likely is. So that's why I love this time of year. It's wonderful. So I'm going to go into uh, a couple different things. I have two segments on fantasy football for you. The first one is I'm just going to read you just a few tiers of the top players. I'm not going to go into like this whole draft strategy episode. There's podcasts that specialize in that, and they're fantastic. Go check them out. Go read articles. I'm going to give you just a little taste, okay? I'm going to give you a taste of, you know, some work that someone else has done even. it's uh, This is from the Fantasy Pros, fantasypros.com. You know, every year, it's good to start doing your research. So we're just going to go over a little bit of what their top, let's say, you know, I'm going to go through their first three tiers of players, okay? Just to, just so we can just do this. We just need to do this. So, <clears throat> excuse me. All right. So tier number one consists of five players. And the number one, and this is pretty unanimous for a lot of players, people and pundits and experts out there that the number one fantasy football player that should be taken off the draft board in everyone's league is Jonathan Taylor. Running back for Indianapolis, he's a beast, and he's really young. He's powerful. He can catch. He can run. He's their workhorse guy. He is the running back. I mean, you know, I don't know. There aren't many like him, and he is that dude. He's that good. He's incredible. He should be number one taken, although it's kind of strange, actually, as I'm saying this, I'm I'm starting to already get in my head a little bit. Because number two is Christian McCaffrey. And when he's healthy, I think it's safe to say he's the best fantasy football player, like, almost ever. I mean, he's just, he, <laughs> if he's right, he's going to give you, like, 40 points. It's insane what he can put up. But he's just so rarely healthy. I, I don't think I would draft him. I do not think I'm drafting him first round. If he's available, if I have, like, the number two pick, um, I would probably go number three, Derrick Henry, before I went Christian McCaffrey, just because of that injury history. Because Derrick Henry is a guy, so I just got finished saying Jonathan Taylor's for sure number one. I'm like, yeah, it always seems to be someone else every year, except for the fact that it's like Derrick Henry. It's just Derrick Henry. He's just, it's gonna. It's probably going to be Derrick Henry. The dude just won't quit. He's so good. And yeah, he's number three. Number four is Dalvin Cook. He's also had some injury troubles over the past few years, so we'll see if he can stay healthy. But when he's right, he's a beast. Um, also excited to see what his brother does over in Buffalo. Uh, all you Georgia fans know what I'm talking about there. Number five after Dalvin Cook is Austin Eckler. Had him last year. He was fantastic. I won my league last year. Yes, indeed, I did. And it was glorious. It was fantastic. Although... I don't know, the participation in our league was a little lackluster last year. So this year, I think it's going to be different. But I did win. Austin Eckler was a big part of that. Uh, tier number two. So this is your second tier of players. And honestly, where your league is going to be one is how you draft in like tier seven and eight. I mean, truly, I, I'll give you a snippet of that. But I, if I do too much of this, we're going to be here forever. So tier number two. Number six overall, Joe Mixon. Seven, Najee Harris. Eight, Justin Jefferson. Nine, Nick Chubb. Ten, Cooper Cup. And 11, Jamar Chase. Whew, Jamar Chase. I had you last year too, buddy. Thank you. Thank you for what you did for me. It was fantastic. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a fair list. That is, they are absolutely up there. You know, the first round is going to pretty much look like all of that. I mean, that's... The first round isn't that exciting just because... You know, you kind of know what's going to happen, and you can't really go wrong. You know, I think the most exciting rounds in fantasy football is like late two through five, you know, and six maybe. I, you know, w once you start getting like into you know ten and eleven, it starts. You just kind of you're 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 seeing what sticks. But, anyways, tier number three. So after those ten, eleven guys, tier number three, you have. Travis Kelsey, DeAndre Swift, Alvin Kamara, Mark Andrews, Saquon Barkley. I hope he stays healthy. That dude is a generational type guy when he's right. 
you know, it's just can't stay healthy. And he's on a terrible team. Uh, after Saquon Barkley, you have Stefan Diggs. He went off last year. Devontae Adams, Debo Samuel, Aaron Jones, CeeDee Lamb, and Javante Williams with Denver. So, Devontae Adams surprised at that. Maybe it's because he's with a new team, so it's one of those, we'll see what he does. Um, but those are the first three tiers. That's kind of how this year is shaping up. That's what the experts are saying. That's who is ranking the highest at the moment. And I have no problem with any of that. It all makes sense. I get it. It all checks out. Fun fact, uh, tier number four, number 28 overall, squeezed right in between A.J. Brown and T. Higgins, is our very own Kyle Pitts. Um, I think he's the third tight end on this. You've got Kelsey, Mark Andrews, and then Kyle Pitts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the third tight end on this like for overall tight ends. So good for him. But just to give you an idea of why, like I think the later rounds are exciting is because look at this, like you've got, you know, in tier number, let's just go five. You've got guys like Cam Akers running back for the Rams. You've got DK Metcalf, Jalen Waddle, Justin Herbert, Deontay Johnson. You start getting into these, like, you know, I mean, these guys can win you your league. I think I got Jamar Chase in like the sixth round last year, maybe later than that. I mean, he's a rookie, so I get it, but God, unreal. You've got Darren Waller at 50. You know, these are the guys where it's like, if you can t- if you can work this out well, I mean, that tier five through eight, that's just going to be, it's going to be good stuff. So thank you, Fantasy Pros, for that information. I still have a lot more research to do. I will say too, don't over-research. You can over-research, I believe. I've done it before. Um, so the next segment I'm going to get into here is uh, the different types of drafters. So which one are you? Here's uh, just a few off the top of my head that I typed up before we started, but I'm going to go over different types of fantasy football drafters. Which one are you? So first one, we have always drafts teams that would have killed three years ago. We have the guy who takes way too many players from their favorite team because they're convinced they will all go off that year. We have the sleeper guy, always seems to know something that everyone else doesn't. We have the guy that's going to take Patrick Mahomes in the first round or any QB that went off the year before. That's 100% going to happen. We have guys who picks uh, injured or suspended players without realizing it and gets really bummed right afterwards. I've seen that myself. Uh, We have the guy that says, hey, I've always wanted to try this fantasy football thing. He drafts and then ghosts the league for the rest of the year. Yet somehow, this guy will beat you in an important matchup late in the season. It's not really a draft type guy. I could have just said new guy, but I think you guys know what I'm talking about. And then we have the guy who proposes trades like the day after the draft. So you draft, and then the next day you get a notification, hey, you want to trade your number one pick for these five guys? Um, some of those guys aren't tradable that you get early on, but you know, there is that guy and yeah, which one are you? I can say at least, uh, the first one I'm guilty of, I always will draft teams that will have, would have killed like three years ago. I do that all the time. I'm, I'm trying to really have to remind myself like, okay, like, you know, (laughs) there are newer guys that have done well that like, they might not have the name recognition. I'm kind of a brand snob when it comes to fantasy football players. Like I really will get extremely wrapped up in, you know, kind of what someone may have done a few years ago. Like, I I would have probably put DeAndre Hopkins as my number one wide receiver, and he's great. He's fantastic, but there's a reason I think, and I think it's accurate, that Justin Jefferson, I think, was the number one receiver on that list and that Jamar Chase is higher than him. But I'm that guy. I always have a great team in the past. Um, I also will take too many players from my favorite team because I'm convinced everybody's going to be amazing. I do that all the time. You know, you've heard me talk about Desmond Ritter. I think he's going to be a Hall of Famer already, and so I'll probably pick him up. You know, I don't know, whatever. Um, Yeah, so last thing on fantasy football, and this is just a fact. This is something that you all need to know. This is real. This is just exactly kind of how, if you want to know here, right here, right now, just what kind of person I am, I think this sums it up a lot. Um, ESPN Fantasy Football is the best fantasy football app and system. Hands down. Not Yahoo, not NFL.com, especially not Fantrax. If you're a Fantrax person, just turn off the podcast right now because we will fundamentally disagree on literally everything. No Fantrax, none of that other stuff. ESPN Fantasy Football is the best. Um, Kidding, sort of. Kidding about the 
we disagree on everything. I, maybe not though. Fan tracks is terrible. Uh, I just really, it's it's so bad. It's it's horrible. ESPN's so easy, guys. It's so it's it's so clean. It looks so good on your phone. It has it's such a sleek operating system. It's like iPhone versus Android. It's just objectively the iPhone. It just feels good. So you know maybe that'll start a whole new debate too. Anyways, uh, you know what? Who cares? Use whatever system you want because fantasy football is here. It's in the air, and it's time to let her rip, baby. Um, and draft late. Draft late in the preseason. Don't don't draft now. There's still like two preseason games left. There's a lot more camp left. You don't want. I mean, you know, look, Drake London banged up his knee, and he's fine, by the way. All reports are saying that Drake London is perfectly fine. Um, but you know, what if he wasn't? And you already drafted, and you drafted him. I'm just saying, you know, just chill. Um, okay, going to move on to some Atlanta Braves recap. The Atlanta Braves have hosted the Houston Astros here in Atlanta over the weekend. We take two out of three from them, and I'm still getting over this sickness. It's been quite, uh, I don't know what the word is, irritating. <clears throat> I feel fine, but... I hate when I'm coughing and sniffing and stuff like that in the microphone, but I'm going to try and be good about that. So anyways, Houston Braves, uh, Braves, Houston Astros recap, whatever. Braves take two out of three, and, you know, the initial thoughts on this series was that, like, I was much more concerned about the Mets. The Mets scared me way more than Houston, so once we took care of the Mets and spanked their little baby behinds, I kind of felt fine about the Astros coming to town. I mean, I knew objectively that they are like one of the best teams, if not the best team in the American League. But, you know, maybe it's because we just beat them in the World Series. They were coming back. But after we got through the Mets the way that we did, I was like, man, we're back. And you know how awesome it is as a fan when you watch your favorite team go up against any team and you go, yeah, we got a shot. We're good. I'm not like nervous, you know, I'm like excited. I'm like, yeah, we can do this. I feel that way about the Braves in this very moment because even the game that we lost, so we took two or three. I'm going to go through each game briefly. Um, So I'll work my way backwards. How's that? So on Sunday's game, it was a day game, uh, Houston won 5-4. It's the only one we lost, but we still made it interesting late. And that was kind of the thing going into the ninth inning even. I was like, oh, we got this because we were just coming off the night before an epic walk-off win. That was a fun game. Uh, a really fun game. Went into extra innings. It was fantastic. So, you know, even going into the ninth, when we were down three, I was like, yeah, we can do this. And we did make it interesting. And our players played good. I mean, let's see any uh, if there's any significant statistics here. Um, Ronald Acuna goes one for four. Dansby, one for four. Matt Olson goes two for three with a walk and two RBIs. He had a monster home run. That guy, when he gets a hold of one... Man, he's strong. He's a big dude. I mean, he's kind of like, there are other guys that might look more like jacked. Like Giancarlo Stanton just looks just jacked. You know what I mean? Just beefed up, just chiseled out of a diamond. But Matt Olson is like, he might weigh similar to Giancarlo Stanton. You know what I mean? Like he's really tall and he's just thick. He's stout. And when he gets a hold of one and sends one out there to le- to right or right center, and he's got that swing where he puts his entire just, you know, just um, conviction into it. And his whole body turns around. It almost looks unconventional. I mean, well, it does look unconventional. His stance is unconventional. Him holding the bat out there like that and him swinging his whole body around. But when he gets a hold of one and just stops and stares, it's a beautiful thing. And he had one of those on Sunday. It was fantastic. Um, Vaughn Grissom goes two for four. That dude just won't quit. He won't quit. Uh, Charlie Morton actually pitched a great game. He went six innings. He gave up five hits and two earned runs, and those two earned runs came in one inning, and it was kind of like it just, you know, one thing after another kind of happened real quick, and it got away from him. Um, but he was on point. He was locating well. His slider was nasty on Sunday. I mean, it just darted from one side of the plate to the other. It was fantastic. And he had 11 Ks. Charlie Morton had 11 strikeouts. I didn't realize that, actually, until right now. But he had 11 strikeouts on Sunday. Fantastic game. So, you know, things happen. It got away from us a little bit late. You know, we gave up um, two runs in the eighth and then one in the ninth. So late, when it was still close, we kind of let, you know, we were tied going into the eighth, and we gave up two. 
and then one in the ninth to make it down three. But it, we almost came back. Uh, Michael Harris struck out when it was like um, – I was kind of like, okay, he's going to do this. Like, we're going to do it again. We're going to walk this thing off again or at least send it to, uh, to extra innings. But we didn't, and that's okay because we, uh, you know, you want to win series. It's crazy to think we're going to win every single game. You know, if you win 100 games, you had an incredible season, and that means you still lost. Well, I don't know what the math is on that. 62? Yeah, something like that. Um, so, yeah. I'm not going to win every game, but Bobby Cox always said, you want to win the series. You want to take the series, the series, the series. Because if you do that, I mean, just think, you go three, you know, you go two and one every single series. I mean, you're ending up with 100 wins in the season. So anyhow, we did that. Uh, before I go on to the previous games, um, in the last 10, the Braves are eight and two, and we are four games behind the Mets at this very moment. So the Mets just keep winning too, but whatever. Four games, that's fine. Because we're four games behind the Mets, but we have a comfortable place in the wild card standing. So either way, if we keep playing like this, we will be playing in October, and it's going to be glorious. So other games here on Saturday night. This was a fantastic game. So we won in the bottom of the 11th inning. Uh, and <clears throat> I would like to send a shout-out and a thank you to the shift. Thank you, shift. Because the shift is exactly why we won this game. Because uh, Matt Olson had a check swing double that just dribbled through where the shortstop would be if there was no shift. And so he check swinged it. He was smiling as he was rounding first base. Literally, Matt Olson was like laughing, and he just ran to second. And, he, and someone scored, and he got a double. It was hilarious. Dansby Swanson was smiling when he came through. Like no one could believe it. And then shortly thereafter, I don't know if it was the next batter or the one after that, but Travis Darno came in to pinch hit, and he had like a weak grounder to where the second baseman would be because they were shifting him, and that came in to score the winning run. It was fantastic, but it was really exciting because, you know, when you're the home team and you're in extra innings, you go second. So in both, like in the 10th inning, the Astros scored two, and... This was a great game pitching-wise, by the way. I'm going to get into that after this. But in the 10th inning, the Astros scored two and took the lead, you know, when we're up, I think it was 3-1 by that point. And then we came back and had to score two. So that was really exciting. And then they scored one in the 11th, and we scored two in the 11th. So really fun stuff. The the, the guy on second in the extra innings really is kind of next level when it comes to excitement. Really fun to watch. Just, you know, I mean, it's it, it just, I mean, look at that right there. It's like we... Both teams had one run apiece after the ninth inning, and then a combined, what is that, seven runs were then scored in the 10th and 11th. It's because the entire feel and vibe and mentality of the game changes when you start each inning with a runner on second. It's fantastic. So in this game, the star of the show was the pitchers, and for us, that person was Spencer Strider. So Spencer Strider had nine strikeouts, one earned run on three hits and six innings pitched. And he was perfect through four? <clears throat> or maybe it got split up in the fourth, his perfect game. But yeah, he's a beast. He just continues to be. And you always wonder about these young guys. You go, okay, you start out strong, you get a lot of hype, especially you got the mustache and you throw 100 miles an hour and you're kind of small in stature. So that just alone makes you interesting and followable. You know, I mean, Spencer Strider is just a fan. I mean, what a wonderful, just human being he is for just all that he is. And he has kept it up. I mean, he, we've got like two guys that are legitimate contenders for Rookie of the Year, and that's Spencer Strider and Michael Harris. I don't even know who the other contestants are. I know there's there are some other guys who are playing really well, but those guys are just unreal. It'd be kind of cool if it came down to those two. You know what I mean? But, um, yeah. Uh, good job by Spencer Strider, and <clears throat> all of our guys did a good job, really. You know, great game. All around great game. It was a pitching duel up until the very last inning, and get this. Of course, the guy with the most, most hits on Saturday, Vaughn Grissom, goes two for four with an RBI. He just won't quit. He will not stop. Vaughn Grissom cannot stop being awesome. He just locked up Michael Harris. Get ready to bust out the checkbook because this guy's the truth. I mean, he's only been around for like two weeks, but you know what I'm saying. He's, I mean, he looks good. So if he if he goes into the end of the year like this, if you can make it past like a month 
doing this and pitchers still haven't figured you out? Because you know that can happen. That happens all the time where you start out strong and then you get a couple months cold because pitchers figure out that we are they are professionals, by the way. But if he can keep doing this the way that Michael Harris has, lock him up. Although I don't know what's going to happen when Ozzy comes back. You know, I mean, I guess, well, we are gonna should have a free DH spot based on how Azuna, his life is play, playing out right now. We'll get into that here in a sec. So maybe they're going to play around with that because, like, who, what do you do right now unless you throw one of them in the outfield? And they've tried they tried that with Austin Riley when he was a rookie, and that was kind of weird, but they just wanted his bat. But Von Grissom's a great athlete, but you're not necessarily going to replace Dansby, Riley, or Ozzie. You know, I don't know. I don't know how that would work. So that should be interesting because Ozzy is going to be back soon. Within a couple of weeks, we should be seeing Ozzy always back in the lineup. So excited to see that. Um, Friday's game, we won a little more handily, 6-2. to two. Uh, Awesome game there. Austin Riley hit just a three-run bomb in the beginning of the game to kind of give us a spark that we just kept throughout the game. So Acuna goes 2-4 for four in that game. Dansby Swanson goes three for five. Austin Riley goes two for four with three RBIs. Dansby had two RBIs. He's not getting talked about enough, in my opinion. A lot of these guys are getting these huge contract, you know, extensions. Well, Michael Harris is is the guy that has been in the news lately about that. But it's Dansby's turn. And, and according to sources, uh, I say sources because I heard this on the broadcast, so I don't have anything in front of me to source. Uh, but the broadcast booth had referenced that Dansby Swanson's agent has begun talks with the Braves about this. Fun fact, too, is Dansby Swanson's agent is who used to represent Freddie Freeman. Whoa! <laughs> Better rethink that move, buddy. Um, I shouldn't say that because I think some people have gotten in trouble for slander there. So anyway, ne- never mind. You're cool. It's fine. You know, Dansby, keep him. You know, do your thing. Just, you know, don't go anywhere. I, lo- I love Dansby Swanson. I mean, I'm wondering if they would go if he's too expensive like, let's say Dansby want this monster deal. And they go, well, we got this guy Vaughn Grissom that I think is a natural shortstop, if I'm not mistaken. And the minor leagues was playing shortstop. So, ooh, that might be a little awkward. But I think Dansby's awesome. He's the hometown kid. He looks the part. He feels the part. I know that doesn't really mean anything, but I think it does. You know, his energy is, um, it's, it's fantastic. I, I really do think he's kind of one of the guys that I would consider to be like the heartbeat of this team. You know, he always hustles. He never seems to be, like, a bummer, you know? <clears throat> there are guys that you watch. Sometimes Ronald Acuna looks like a bummer. I'm just going to be honest. Sometimes he kind of slouches his shoulders, and he's kind of like, oh, man, he kind of has this, like, weird little, you know, I don't know. He, he just seems immature to me at points. I'm a big Ronald fan, but, you know, whatever. That's the truth. And Dansby just seems like the guy that you just want to be around all the time. Him, Ozzy's got that. Um, yeah. Anyways, so we win more handily on Friday, and uh, just go Braves. Four games back, because the Mets keep winning, but I'm not worried about it. You know, come October, it's all different. It all changes. All you got to do is make it to the dance, and like I said before, right, there's no team that makes me really, like, I'm not I'm not worried about a single team right now. G- give us the Dodgers. Okay, Cool. It's like I don't feel like we're out of our league, whereas two years ago I did. I was like, oh, my God, we're playing the Dodgers? How cool. (laughs) You know, when it was in the NLCS, I was like, how neat is this that we might do this, guys? Like, this is so cool. Like, now it's like, no, yeah, come on, Dodgers, let's go. Um, And other teams realize that about us, too, because we just took care of the Astros. And, you know, I think they had a lot of confidence, even in that last loss. So good stuff. Go Braves. A um, couple things to get into specifically here about the Braves. I'm going to try and go through this quick, but we got to talk about Marcel Ozuna. So Marcel Ozuna over the weekend gets arrested for DUI. And the internet is a wonderful thing because people have already started referencing that every time he gets arrested, we win the World Series. <laughs> so thank you, Marcel. It was very selfless of you. I really appreciate you, you know, going, you know what, guys? Hey, look, we need this is around the time that we started realizing we had something. And so I'm going to keep this good energy going. So thanks. Um, There is body cam footage 
of this. And as the officer pulls up to the car, Marcel does say, I'm Marcel Ozuna with Atlanta Braves. And the officer says, yeah, and you're batting 213. <laughs> so you know, he didn't say that. He instead, he handed him his ID and like his Braves ID. And you know, he was just drunk. It sucks. Honestly, I do feel bad. I, I, feel, I feel bad for him because... I mean, I don't know. I do and I don't. It's like, get your shit together, man. Um, you know, it's like things just seem to be falling apart. And I don't know. I mean, he's playing terrible. He got booed at Sunday. On on Sunday, he got booed. I wonder, too, like in that moment, if he had played really well on Sunday. Let's say he went like four for four with like six RB highs or something just insane. I wonder if people would have like cheered really like even more loudly for him because of like how crazy is this that this is our guy. Um but I don't know, man. Marcel, baseball and my fandom aside, I, I, I wish you well. I, you know, I hope you figure your life out. But, I mean, as far as, like, you being on the Braves, like, yeah, dude, it's, I mean, that was bad luck. Bad luck. Bad luck when you're drunk driving and the cop comes up. He's like, hey, I'm Marcel with the Atlanta Braves. Honestly, I mean, you know, you should have said a different name because if, if there was a true Braves fan, that then that cop may have been. I mean, he lives in Atlanta. Chances are he's a Braves fan. But Braves fans right now probably would arrest you just to get you out of the lineup. You know what I mean? They'd probably go, okay, yeah, come with us for the next, I don't know, two months, and we can get someone else in the DH spot, if you don't mind. Um, but, yeah, we'll see what happens with him. You know, that's two sh pretty big strikes as far as off-the-field stuff is concerned. Really three, because there was, I think there was two domestic violence kind of issues with Marcelo Zuna, but the last year's arrest was a lot louder but I don't think that was the first time that it happened. So I don't want to dig into these guys' personal lives, but, you know, that was headline worthy, needless to say. So hope he, uh, you know, gets his own life together, and I hope the Braves make the right move because I think it's time to move on. I mean, he's just not – if you take all of this out of it, like, it was time to sit him anyways. So this is kind of, I would think, might be the cherry on top. We'll see what happens. Um, okay, Austin Riley. So here's something I want to <clears throat> just – think about real quick. So bear with me while I do it. I'm not going to wander off too much on this because I understand that you don't want to listen to me just think. But I'm thinking, is Austin Riley an MVP? A lot of people are talking about how he's an MVP. He's our MVP candidate. MVP, 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 and I get it. He's the best hitter on our team. He's fantastic. He is our, he's becoming the star of the Atlanta Braves. And he just got paid as such, and appropriately so, because he is that good. And my thing is, like, how do you really calculate value for MVP? Is it just stats, or is it context, or is it both? I'm sure it's a combination of both in some way. It has to be. But I actually think Austin Riley might have been more of an MVP last year than he is this year. And hear me out. This year, he doesn't lead any of the major statistical categories, and he's only top five and two. And he's top five in hits, and he's uh, top five in home runs. And he's fifth in hits in the National League and second in home runs in the National League. He's a very good fielder. This is something people don't talk about as much. Naturally, fielding isn't as sexy as your hitting statistics, but he is third in fielding percentage among third basemen in the NL. So, and it's funny fact about that stat, he's only one one-thousandth of a percentage point behind the second place in fielding percentage, which is Cabrian Hayes in Pittsburgh, and Nolan Arenado is first. This is among third basemen. So he's very he's a very good third baseman. Fielding percentage is fantastic. But statistically, if we're just looking at that, right now the MVP is 100% Paul Goldschmidt. So just to give you an idea of what I mean by this, in the National League, uh, here's, how we, here's where we stand. Uh, first in batting average is Paul Goldschmidt batting 340 this year. Unreal. Second is Freddie Freeman at 324. Third is Jeff McNeil with the Mets, uh, 321. Then we have Jose Iglesias with Colorado at 312, and Trey Turner with the Dodgers at 305. So Austin Riley's not even on that list. He's he's sub 300 right now. Home runs. We have Kyle Schwarber with 34. Paul Goldschmidt and Austin Riley are tied for second with 31. Then we've got Pete Alonso with 30. Christian Walker with Arizona. At 29. Um, RBIs, Pete Alonzo with 102. Ooh, that's unreal. Uh, Paul Goldschmidt, 100. So Paul Goldschmidt, just for these top three, average one, home runs, two, RBIs, two. Uh, Francisco Lindor with 84, Matt Olson with 83, and Trey Turner with 83. So Austin Riley's not on that list. Hits, Freddie Freeman, one. Trey Turner, 
Two, Paul Goldschmidt. Three, there's Paul again. Dansby Swanson is actually four, and Austin Riley is five. So he's on the top five there with hits, and then you have stolen bases after that. But Austin Riley is, is only on the top five for three of those. So if you look at that just on its own, I would go, okay, well, Paul Goldschmidt keeps coming up, and he's coming up high on all these. He is statistically the best and most valuable player. I mean, God, Freddie Freeman's making a case. I mean, just statistically. Okay, he's playing really good. Um, you know. Yeah, if his RBIs were more, that's why I think it, right now it goes to Paul. So, you know, I'm a huge Austin Riley guy, but the reason why I'm saying that last year he may have been more of an MVP is because his stats were there. I mean, he hit over 300, he had 30-plus home runs, and he had over 100 RBIs. I mean, that alone is going to, you know, be a year that sticks out when you flip over his baseball card. Fantastic year last year. Very, very, very good. But he's still, like last year, contextually... The second half, when we really needed him and when our entire team, like the theme of the Atlanta Braves, the 2021 Atlanta Braves, was in the second half, they just turned it on and never looked back. And he did that more than anyone. And because we went on to win the World Series and because of what he did and how he anchored our team and how he turned it on like he did, it, like, the true most value, most value that anyone got out of a player (laughs) <laughs> was last year's Austin Riley. He had the most value out of a player. But how do you calculate these things? Do you go the most valuable if you just put a price tag on somebody and just went, what would you pay to have that on your team? Most valuable player. And I go, well, if you're just, look, I mean, right now, it's, it's just, it's Paul Goldschmidt. It's nothing against Austin Riley. It's just like, yeah, I just, I don't know. How how do these things go? Also, if you're Paul Goldschmidt, and I don't watch a lot of Cardinals games, I'm, I'm a fan of him, and I'm a fan of the Cardinals just, you know, from afar because I respect their town uh, and how much they love baseball. I think any baseball fan should appreciate what St. Louis means for the sport. But, um, yeah, maybe he just, like, always blows it in the ninth inning. Maybe he's batting zero in the ninth inning, and then you go, okay, well, that's not very valuable. But, you know, who knows? How many games has he just won in the fifth inning because he's just went three for three with two home runs and, you know what I mean? So, yeah, is Austin Riley an MVP? In my heart, he is. But I don't think that he is yet. There's still some more baseball to be played, and it's about to get really important going into the last month and a half. And this is where, you know, a front runner is going to make themselves very clear. But, um he, Austin Riley is a, he's 100% in the conversation. I think particularly because of how good he is on the field as well as where he does stand among the league leaders. So he's not in the top five, but he's in the top tens for a lot of things. So, you know, yeah, it's just, you know, it is. maybe I'll get some hate on this. I don't know. I just, I see it pretty much every day. It's Austin Riley MVP, Austin Riley MVP. And I get as carried away with my fandom as anyone. Anyone who listens to this podcast knows that I basically just convinced myself of maybe some ridiculous things. But I don't care. So I get it. I understand where you're coming from. But he's not an MVP yet. So at least as of right now. But I'm pulling for him. I don't doubt him for a second that he is going to put himself in the conversation by the time the year comes to an end. So wrapping up the show here, we're going to go through a couple more things. Uh, let's go through some Falcons updates. So not a whole lot of Falcons news. They've been practicing with the Jets this week, and there's been a few quote-unquote fights. Orlando Ledbetter of uh, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution has tweeted like, oh, there's been three fights. You know, Arthur Smith, I think, accurately corrected him to say they weren't fights, they were skirmishes. And yeah, you saw some people kind of huddled up and getting, you know, rough with one another, but... You know, Arthur Smith was like, yeah, you got guys peacocking. You got people out here playing against people they don't really know. They want to show that they're the best, yada, yada. I haven't really paid attention to any headlines coming out of this um, because there's not really much. It doesn't seem like there's a whole lot to report there. But they play the Jets on Monday night. Of course I'm going to be watching that, and I'm going to be at the preseason game next Saturday, this upcoming Saturday, when the Jacksonville Jaguars come into Atlanta. Can't wait for that. Um... And who knows, we might get to see our starters more that game or maybe less. Who knows, maybe the second game now. Because it used to be the third game, you'd see the first team more. Uh, Maybe that's changed now since they took away a preseason game. So anyways, 
preseason games uh, Monday night against the Jets should be fun. And Drake London is healthy. He's fine. He's probably not going to play in the preseason. They're going to sit him a lot leading up to the season. But all reports show that he will be ready to go by week one. I can't even find an article that tells me exactly what happened. You know, like, oh, he, like, you know, strained this tendon. No, they just, literally every article just said, yeah, he's okay. He's fine. He'll be okay. Don't worry about it. He's good to go week one. So I believe them. No reason to think otherwise. So I'm going to look, scroll through this article quickly for you guys, the last bit of Falcons. I saw this on bloggingdirty.com, and the article was titled, Five Free Agent Leaders the Falcons Should Sign. You know, I'm going to scroll through this and just see what you think about this. A couple of these names, I was like, oh, my God, no, that's so dumb. <clears throat> um but some of these, maybe it's not them. I don't know. So number one on free agents the Falcons should sign, according to Blogging Dirty and Fan Sided. Uh, number one, Jason Peters. Uh, offensive line, uh, when it comes to the offensive line, it should be all hands on deck, according to this article. That's 100% correct, actually. Our offensive line stinks. So yeah, I mean, you know, I if, if any defensive like lineman or offensive lineman is on this list, I 100% agree. That's just, we should just do that. Like, you know, uh, Deion Sanders was saying, and he's been all over the internet, and I love it. I love when I see Prime show up on my feed. But he was sitting in his office like, yeah, at this level, you know, it's one in the trenches. It is in the NFL, too. I mean, it's like, you know, when you guys, when your guys are running for their life, your quarterback, and when you're dead last in the league in sacks, it's noticeable. So, yeah, Jason Peters, come on. I'm cool with that. Whatever. He's great. Um, Josh Norman was number two on this, on this list. Cornerback, uh, formerly was playing, well, he's a former Panther. That's when he was in his prime. And then he was with Washington for a while. And he famously got into a lot of skirmishes with Odell Beckham Jr. Last year, it looks like he was playing with the San Francisco 49ers. And he's well past his prime. And, you know, I guess we just need more depth. Although our secondary, it sounds like, has really come around. Especially with A.J. Terrell. I mean, obviously, that dude, he really is, like that good, um, but yeah, whatever, I don't know, I don't care about that, sure, get Josh Norman, don't have a huge problem with that, although it just kind of feels weird, maybe because of just him being with Carolina, and being so good with Carolina, and being so loud when he was at Carolina, maybe that actually makes me feel a little weirder about that, anyhow, number three, this is the one that I thought was just absolutely just silly, number three on their list of who the Falcons should sign was Cam Newton, get out of here. Stop it. Don't. I'm not even going to read this part of this article to you. You know, we got Marcus Mariota, Cam Newton, you know, yeah, you're the guy that drafts too late in fantasy football. Like in 2015, he was amazing, but he just hasn't been good. You know, you can't like, what are you going to get with Cam Newton? I don't know. We just drafted a quarterback in the third round and we brought in Marcus Mariota. I mean, maybe they're still looking, but like, is Cam Newton right now going to be a big upgrade from Marcus Mariota? I mean, I don't think so. I could be wrong. I don't think so, though. I mean, if you're going to really make a big splash at quarterback, go get Jimmy G. But it's like, it's weird, though, because you already got Marcus, and it seems like they're pretty committed to the guy. But <laughs> I could, I, I, they are, they could very well surprise me. They certainly did with the whole Deshaun Watson thing. Wasn't that exciting for, I mean, like a week? I, I was like, when the whole, when Deshaun Watson was about to maybe come to Atlanta, I think I literally for three days just sat on my phone and just kept hitting refresh, 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 refresh. And when we went to the Browns, I couldn't believe it because it was just either us or the Saints at that point. So, you know, whatever. I guess, hey, it all comes out in the wash. So I guess I'm glad that didn't happen because I don't know how we would pay anything to anyone. Number four on this list is Richard Sherman. So some more cornerback depth at who they think we should sign. I don't know. If he's good, he's good. Cool, whatever. I, um, a lot of people don't like Richard Sherman. I don't have a problem with him. He was just kind of loud. Yeah, when people are obnoxious and loud, I mean, everybody is constantly in front of a video camera these days. So it's like, I take it all with a grain of salt. But Richard Sherman was amazing. And I don't know if he still is, but if he's a free agent, if we're looking for depth, veteran depth is important. I'm cool with that. This fifth one on this list, <clears throat> I was, uh, I actually, this would be pretty awesome, was Emmanuel Sanders. He's also well past his prime, but the dude's just kind of like, um, 
He's just the guy that I feel like wherever he plays, he's going to stay healthy and he's going to like catch touchdowns, especially in the playoffs. Like Emmanuel Sanders just seems like that guy. I don't even know who to compare him to, but he's he was a great receiver and he still is really good, I think. But he, um, yeah, the Falcons need receivers. You know, that's all there is to it. So curious to see what you think about that list. Number five, Emmanuel Sanders. Number four, Richard Sherman. Number three, Cam Newton. Number two, Josh Norman. And number one, Jason Peters. What do you think about those free agents coming to Atlanta? Uh, Yeah, let me know. Okay, moving on past the Falcons, we have got Stetson Bennett. This is a quick little update, but an awesome, awesome thing for Mr. Bennett. Stetson Bennett is on the cover of Sports Illustrated this month, and he looks good. He looks good. The, the, the cover says Stetson Bennett, a Georgia hero. Now he goes back to double down on that national title. Yes, he does. Um, just cool when you see your guys getting national attention like that. Uh, you know, and, and on this article, the first couple paragraphs, for the first time in program history, a national championship winning starting quarterback will return under center for the University of Georgia. It has been an improbable career, to say the least, when talking about Stetson Bennett. A once walk-on projected to never see a snap in a Georgia uniform, then transferred to a junior college for one season before returning to Athens, where he'd eventually earn his opportunity as a signal caller for his beloved Georgia Bulldogs. His story really is unbelievable. They're probably going to have a statue of that guy at some point in time. I mean, it, it's, it's, it, it, it's perfect. He's got the perfect like football sports story. Hard work, determination, perseverance, you know, grit, gut, just drive, spirit, all the things that you'd want in a human being. It's a tale as old as time. When you have those things, you can accomplish your dreams. And he literally did that when nobody believed in him, but he just, he got a chip on his shoulder. I'd love, it's, it's perfect. It's perfect. His story is great. So good job, Stetson Bennett, from where you went so from where you were to now being on the cover of Sports Illustrated, you're the guy. You're the dude. You're awesome. Um, UGA is closing in on another top five recruiting class. Uh, hey, NILs much? Hey, maybe. Um, in July, Kirby actually said that they have 95 guys with NIL deals. He also clarified in that interview uh, his position by saying that he at one point said that NILs were bad, but now he believes that there is more good with NILs than bad. We just mostly talk about the bad. So that's Kirby Smart's kind of clarifying his position on this. That was a pretty loud thing over the summer, maybe because there wasn't much else going on in the sporting world. But if anyone doesn't know this, quick recap, NILs is name, image, and likeness. And what that means is that as a college player, you can use your name, image, and likeness to make money. That could be via endorsement or among other things and other creative ways that people find ways to pay players. And where I think in this, in this was illegal before, the NCAA would not allow players to make money on their name. You know, Todd Gurley got in trouble for signing a jersey for someone, I think. You know, whatever. Made a few hundred bucks. Who cares? But people are now allowed to use their name to make money, and I think it's a wonderful thing. I don't care about it. Hey, you're a free American. Go out. If you make something of yourself, you know, cash in, baby. But uh, where there's concern is that a lot of teams now have these collectives where these businesses and marketers and powerful people and donors to the school can put together a pool of money by saying, hey, if you come to this school... We're going to pay you money. And it's not coming like directly from the university. It's coming from these people who are like, you know, businesses who are going to use your name now on their stuff. But they're, you know, whatever. There's different incentives to get people at your school. And I think it's it's been described as the wild, wild west. And so coaches have very publicly been concerned, especially I think with players being 18 years old, not knowing how to handle money and, you know, like – being promised the world, and maybe it doesn't come true. Maybe you get promised when you're a junior in high school, hey, come to the University of Stupid Florida, and we're going to pay you $8 million. And then are they going to go through with it? And then is you know, Nick Saban was saying, if you're the big donor, are you going to be bragging about how you brought him to that school? And then if he doesn't play well, are you still going to pay him that much money? I'm sure there's incentives involved. So who knows? That's why a lot of people are getting excited about the University of Miami right now. Because there's so much talent around Miami that, you know, how how are they losing all of this talent to these surrounding states? And if you can get people to lure them in with money and with just the allure of playing 
in South, Southern Florida, in Miami, and having a good time at college and living that life. And then, you know, there's a lot of money down there, a lot of money in Miami. It's kind of like next level money down there. Rich people in Georgia go to Miami and they feel like insecure. They go, oh, yeah, no, I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll order in tonight. You guys go out, have fun. It's cool, whatever. I don't want to go spend $10,000 on, you know, brunch. So, um, yeah, that's the NIL thing. And so uh, Kirby was kind of saying like, hey, look, he gave a couple of good examples. One guy's paying for his dad's dialysis with some money he's receiving from NIL. Another kid who was a walk-on, maybe he's a tight end or a safety. I can't remember the name, but he's receiving some NIL money, and he was a walk-on, and now he's getting to pay for all of his school with NIL money. So there's some wonderful things happening with this. Um, and, and we'll see how it unfolds over the next few years. I'm sure they're going to straighten these things out and kind of tighten it up a little bit, you know, but who knows? Um, so anyways, uh, with that being said, we did have another fantastic recruiting class just to give you guys an idea at how good Kirby smart and his staff is at recruiting. Um, in 2017, we were number three overall, 2018, number one overall, 2019, number two overall, 2020, number one overall, 2021, oh, a terrible year. We were number four overall in 2021, and in 2022, we're looking at the moment as we are number three. So yeah, we're, we're recruiting like crazy. It's fantastic. Some names to, uh, to keep an eye out for uh, from Columbus, Georgia, five-star defensive lineman Michael Williams. We have uh, just listed as athlete from Jefferson, Georgia, Malachi Starks, five-star guy. Marvin Jones, five-star guy, edge rusher it looks like, from Fort Lauderdale, another Southern Florida guy, another Florida guy from Jacksonville. Uh, Jaheim Singletary, five-star guy. He's a cornerback. Um, another Florida guy, Bradenton, Dalen Everett, five stars, coming out of Florida. These guys have already enrolled. They're good to go. This is this year's class. Then we've got a list of four stars, and, and I know the stars, like, once you get to the school, I mean, Todd Gurley was a three-star. So stars don't mean everything, but they mean something. They don't mean nothing. And we've got, after these five stars, who have already enrolled, good to go, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, seventeen 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, enrolled four-stars, and then a number of three. So, yeah, a lot of talent coming to UGA as always. So, good job. Congratulate. You know what? Congratulations, UGA. You did it. Well done. Looking forward to another great year of following the dogs. So, um, I think that's everything, guys. It's been a long show. I appreciate you sticking with me if you have. Um, I'm going to end it with this. There's an insane play uh, in high school football. This happened in week one in high school football in Georgia. And Loganville uh, beat Monroe. And it was in quadruple overtime, and the uh, go-ahead touchdown was a no-look behind the back pass. So basically, they ran this like play fake. It was like a play action, and the quarterback was running like literally backwards, facing the back end zone, and he just did like a no-look, completely tossed it over his head without seeing anything, and it went right into this guy's arms in the end zone. It was a fantastic, beautiful-looking play. I don't even, I can't even follow it. But if you just look up. Um, Justin Felder, uh, at Justin underscore Fox 5, tweeted this uh, on August 20th. So, you know, go find it. It's a great clip. Great, great clip. So, congratulations, Loganville. Hilarious. And quadruple overtime when you win like that. Amazing. So, football's back, and I can't wait for it. So, we're going to wrap this thing up. As always, I want to end the show by telling you guys, go make someone's day. Go have a fantastic day and try and make it about someone else. You know, it's not all about you. Thank God. So it's easy to do. I know we're starting our week. We're all, you know, maybe not looking forward to getting back into the office, but it is what it is. Got to accept it. So go out and just be a joy to be around. You know, just lighten up. Think about someone else's needs before your own, and you'll find that your own troubles will slip away. So, thank you as always for listening. I love you, and I will see you on Wednesday. All right, see ya.